Wednesday, January 1, 1953, the world witnessed the introduction of the Vickers Viscount, the first turboprop-powered civil airliner into passenger service by British European Airways. With the advent of jet airliners in 1952, many airline managers and economists began to question the future of turboprop aircraft. Despite these reservations, British European Airways remained committed to the turboprop concept, citing its superior economics. In 1953, the airline issued a specification for a new aircraft that could seat 100 passengers and achieving a maximum speed of 370 knots. This specification would ultimately lead to the development of the Vickers Vanguard, an enlarged derivative of the Viscount. It conducted its maiden flight in 1955, and BEA was beginning to recognize the potential of jet aircraft. In response, the airline announced its requirements for a short-haul second-generation jet airliner in July 1956. The specification called for an aircraft that could carry a payload of 20,000 pounds or 70 passengers over a distance of 1,000 miles. It would need to weigh around 100,000 pounds, use 6,000-foot runways, and cruise at a speed of 610 to 620 miles per hour. It would also require more than two engines. Companies raced to meet the BEA specification. De Havilland's proposal, the DH-121, would eventually emerge as the frontrunner. As it progressed through the development phase, it became clear that the aircraft would be a significant player in the short-haul market. The project was not without its challenges. Industry consolidation and rival proposals from Boeing and Bristol threatened to derail the program. But BEA remained committed to the project, and on February 12, 1958, the British government authorized the airline to commence contractual negotiations. In April 1958, de Havilland firmed up the aircraft's configuration, and by mid-1961, it was ready for its maiden flight. The aircraft's market prospects looked promising, with de Havilland's market research department forecasting sales of up to 550 aircraft by 1965. In March 1959, British European Airways expressed concerns about the payload range capacity, fearing it might be too great for their needs. The airline petitioned de Havilland to reduce the scale of the design to suit their revised projections, which reflected a decline in passenger growth and the imminent arrival of a large fleet of turboprop Vickers vanguards. De Havilland concurred with BEA's concerns, but also highlighted the challenges they had faced in meeting the airline's original specifications. Observers noted that the British aircraft industry had again stumbled into the pitfall of designing an aircraft exclusively for one customer, potentially limiting its wider market appeal. The redesigned unit underwent significant changes, including a power plant change. The gross weight was reduced by about a third, the range was cut by more than half, and the seating capacity was decreased by about a quarter. On September 1960, the Trident's name was officially announced at the Farnborough Air Show, reflecting its unique three-jet, triple hydraulic configuration. The Trident's development had been impacted by the reorganization of the British aircraft industry, which had led to delays and compromised its competitiveness against the Boeing 727. The Boeing quickly established a lead over the Trident, and by 1975, only 117 Tridents had been sold, compared to over 1,000 Boeings. A significant opportunity to revitalize the Trident's prospects was lost in the 1960s, when the Avro 776, a proposed maritime patrol aircraft based on the Trident, was not selected. The Avro 776 had promised to provide a significant boost to the Trident program, with its enlarged wing, more powerful Rolls-Royce RB-178 engines, and potential for various military roles. However, the project was ultimately sidelined, and the Trident's development stagnated. Hawker Siddeley Aviation, which had absorbed de Havilland, attempted to revive the Trident's fortunes by entering into discussions with American Airlines. Although American Airlines ultimately declined, it made its maiden flight on January 9, 1962. The Trident had an all-metal construction with a T-tail and a low-mounted wing with a quarter-cord sweepback of 35 degrees. It had three rear-mounted engines, two inside fuselage pods, and the third in the fuselage tail cone with an S-shaped intake duct. One version, the 3B, had a fourth boost engine with a separate intake duct above the main S-duct. It was one of the fastest subsonic commercial airliners, cruising at over 610 miles per hour. At introduction into service its cruise Mach number 
was 0.88 per 380 knots, designed for high speed. With a critical Mach number of 0.93, the wing produced relatively limited lift at lower speeds. This and the aircraft's low thrust-to-weight ratio called for prolonged takeoff runs. Nevertheless, it fulfilled BEA's 6,000-foot field length criterion, and its relatively staid airfield performance was deemed adequate before the arrival into service of the Boeing 727 and later jet airliners built to 4,500-foot field length criteria. The aerodynamics and wing were developed by a team led by Richard Clarkson, who would later use the Trident wing design as the basis for the wing of the Airbus A300 and won the Mullard Award in 1969. The plane's first version, Trident 1C, had the unusual capability of using reverse thrust prior to touchdown. The throttles could be closed in the flare and reverse idle set to open the reverser buckets. At pilot discretion, up to full reverse thrust could then be used prior to touchdown. This was helpful to reduce hydroplaning and give very short landing runs on wet or slippery runways while preserving wheel brake efficiency and keeping wheel brake temperatures low. It had a complex, sophisticated and comprehensive avionics fit, which was successful in service. This comprised a completely automatic blind landing system developed by Hawker Siddeley and Smith's Aircraft Instruments. It was capable of guiding the aircraft automatically during airfield approach, flare, touchdown and even rollout from the landing runway. The system was intended to offer Autoland by 1970. In the event, it enabled it to perform the first automatic landing by a civil airliner in scheduled passenger service on June 10, 1965, and the first genuinely blind landing in scheduled passenger service on November 4, 1966. The ability to land in fog solved a major problem at London Heathrow and other British airports. Since it could operate safely to airfields equipped with suitable ILS installations, it could operate schedules regardless of weather, while other aircraft were forced to divert. The advanced avionics displayed the aircraft's current position relative to the ground on a moving map display on the center instrument panel. This electromechanical device also recorded the aircraft's track using a stylus plotting on a motor-driven paper map. Positional information was given by a Doppler navigation system which read ground speed and drift data which. It was the first airliner fitted with a quick access flight data recorder. This sampled 64 variables, converted them into a digital format, and stored them on magnetic tape for ground analysis. Later the system included a voice recorder. The Trident was involved in a series of accidents, resulting in a total of eight hull losses. These accidents claimed the lives of 343 people. The most notable accidents include the Staines Air Disaster, which killed 118 people, and the collision over Yugoslavia, which killed everyone on board both planes. Other accidents occurred in Mongolia, China, and Hong Kong. The last Trident flight took place on December 6, 1989.